and liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Uh, this is now our third meeting where we're back in uh, council chamber, so it seems like we're back in the swing of things. So I just wanted to, uh, before we get started, bring up a couple things about the um, the uh, resignation by Council Member Bavacqua. Um, he is going to um, give his letter of resignation today. We are going to vote on it by, by um, charter. We have to vote to accept it, so we will do that at the end of the meeting. And then also, if people want to make some farewell comments to Council Member Block, we can do it then. Also, just wanted to say that we have received uh, a number of people who have expressed interest in um, being appointed to the City Council. I'll, I'll just read them quickly. Um, Debbie Allen, Doug Gould, Christian Hauser, Terry Tesh, and Rich Kenzik. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Those two, ha those number have sent in applications so that, that we would consider them. We were a little late in getting the um, notice out, even though we talked about it at the last council meeting. We were late in sending out a spread. So we're going to extend it for um, until Thursday. So if anybody hasn't gotten it in, um, we're going to extend it to Thursday. You need to send a letter to the city clerk. If the city clerk gets that um, anything, I would ask that the city clerk immediately forward it to all the city council members. Um, so the plan is at the next city council meeting, we are going to offer all people who have applied to come before council, and they can make a brief presentation if they choose to. They do not have to, um, so that is up to them, and is also up to city council members to contact um, the members who are looking, if they choose to, to talk to that. So really, every, all council people are on their own. People who are interested in applying or have applied can come to the meeting next time and give a brief pre presentation, and then city council will debate what we do. We will make a decision that day. We will not make a decision whatever city, whatever our council decides to do. So that's kind of the game plan for the opening. Um, any questions on that from anybody? Okay, and if there's any questions, contact, you know, members of the city council or the city clerk. Um, but that, so, so Friday or Thursday is going to be, we're going to, it's going to be the cutoff date. So we've kind of set it now at a couple council meetings. We've spread that as much as we can. So we will go from there. Mayor. Councilmember Albrecht. Um, Leanne, you also sent us six other names of people who had sent inquiries. Did any of those people follow up to say Not send yet. an application? Okay. Right. Yeah, Thank so, uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of people who have expressed interest, but they need to officially send something, and so far they haven't. Thank you. Um, and again, the city clerk will send it out to the council people. Um, I'll send a general reminder to those that have already sent right. in an email and given and then also deadline. and then also send an email saying that they can um, have time at the beginning of next meeting to present okay. if if they choose they do Very you good. Know, they do not they do not have to um, okay so now we're next and go on to public comment schedule non schedule first we have a presentation by Marilyn Trent recommending not using certain pesticides so come on up Marilyn, welcome, and I, I agree we probably shouldn't use no, pesticides when we can. Nicotinoids, say it three times quickly. <laughs> so welcome and a name and address for the record. Okay, Marilyn Trent, 624 West University, Rochester, Michigan. I'm here as a resident. Um, so I would like to thank the council for their support over the years, the last two years. I've had overwhelming support from all of you, and I've had overwhelming support from the community. So I wanted to thank you for that. And because of you and your help and your support, uh, the pollinators have implemented 16 of the 24 actions, we're only going after nine, of the Mayor's Monarch Pledge. That was where the guide that we used that was signed into action four years ago by a previous mayor. On another note, Rochester Hills is only pledged to do five, so we are at 16, just as they asked. 
right. So, I'm here today to discuss, and we can move forward. Who am I talking? Somebody's moving these forward. So next, uh, next. Um, thank you. Net, yep, agenda. Don't worry, it's not going to take forever. Next. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> next. <laughs> And then, just for your information, you got this emailed to you. These are the actions that we have implemented. So, if anybody wants to, you know, talk to me or say anything about that, I'm not going to go through them. But there was three parts: communications and convening. We've done all of those. Next, next, program and demonstration gardens. We are doing well with those. All but two, two actions. And the last but not least is the next slide, which is system change. And we have done uh, four of those actions, but number 24 is the one that I'm here to talk to you about today. And that is banning the use of neonicotinoids. Like I said, say that quickly. Um, it's also short, short version is neonics. Next slide, please. Um, and they are pesticides that are used on plants and seeds treated with the neonic pop pesticides on city lands. Now, I know, you can go to the next slide, um, that the city doesn't use them. But I'm here to educate you guys, everyone here, as to why they should ban them as a policy. Um, because, uh, and also require that your contractors purchase only plants and seeds that have not been treated with neonics. And that's a little known fact. No one seems to know that the mm -hmm. seeds, many people, I see you nodding, but they get, they can, the seeds and trees can be sold to you with neonics in them. So basically, the plant, the seeds, the, the seeds create the plant and the trees and the shrubs that are poison. So um, this is a scientific uh, <laughs> definition the uh, neonics were created for agriculture, and at the time they thought it was a safer method of killing soft-shelled insects, and this is in the 90s. Today, it is the most widely used pesticide in the world, and people are finding out the unintended destructive consequences of use of this pesticide. Um, next, um, so like many things, 2016, the EPA confirmed that neonics Emma de Cloprids is highly toxic to bees. And, you know, rather, why? Because rather than simply coating the surface of plants, or uh, neonics, they seep into the plant and they become system, systemic. Mm -hmm. It reminds me a little bit of DDT. I don't know no. if you guys remember mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, and it started being used in the 40s. By 1992, um, there were 487 eagles, eagle, nesting eagles left. And they, uh, it was directly related to DDT. And now there are lots of eagles, lots of vultures, lots of birds. Um, next. Well, systemic is the problem. The plant becomes toxic. Usually you think of killing a bug, you spray it, you step on it, you, I don't know, whatever you want to do with it, <laughs> and it dies. When you create a plant that's poison, that's when the unintended consequences have happened. It isn't good. It means that it kills the insect. It's absorbed by the plants, making the plant itself toxic, which includes the nectar, the pollen, the fruit, and even the foliage. Foliage and the foliage and are toxic. So this plant continues, and it, as it lives, to be uh, poisonous. And when it dies, it's poisonous. And so the pesticide poisons the insects and more, and it will leach into your water, your soil, and it can be absorbed into the fish, birds, and the wildlife food chain. Now, it's taken 20 years for this to start showing up, as many things do, because it started with agriculture in their agricultural fields. Next. So, yeah, the next question is, what's going on with it? Why do people start noticing? Well. Colony collapse disorder has happened. Maybe you, some of you have heard of that. And a third of the beehives have collapsed in the past 15 years. Pesticides is cited as one of the reasons. They're not saying this is the full reason. And I'm not here to say that, that it is. So next, please. So this slide um, shows how does this happen. So the neonics, they're sprayed. They can come from spray. 
and they come, they can, you can spray it on the crops. Yeah, I think, Marilyn, I think you need to stay by oh, the microphone okay. if you okay. could. All right, so you, can you, if you can see it, they yeah. come, they spray the crops, you can get it into the seeds, so the seed spillage, a single coated seed is what they're saying, can kill a songbird. I can't hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. All the way back. <laughs> Thanks, sorry. Okay. No, that's fine. I don't do this very often, so any it's instructions. An setup. It's any instructions can help. <laughs> there we go. Now we can hear you. Okay. So it, what I'm saying is they spray it. It sprays like normal spray, but it also, when it's in the seeds, a, se a single seed, they're saying, can, sil can kill a, a songbird. So you're getting it from the top. You're getting it from the soil. They, um, the um, neonics uh, are in the seed uh coating it so then they grow into the full plant. You can see in the middle, the plant grows. It's in the pollen. This is where they made the connection to the bees. The bees live off the pollen and um, that's when they get infected. Um, the seed fragments go into the dirt and the sprays spread neonics into the soils, into the wetlands. And then it goes into our water and then to the as well as the, the birds and the, and the insects that they eat as well. So, next please. So Michigan is a home of 460 different species of native bees and 450 bird species. That's kind of close there actually. Next. And uh, so a single seed, like I said, coated with neo, neonic can kill a field sparrow and one-tenth of a treated coated seed can impair a bird's uh, reproduction. Some, and also kills the bees. Neonics are often cited as the main cause of declining bee populations, and that's your Chicago Audubon Society. Next, please. So, the bigger problem is that, let's see, 18, that neonectozoids are Com, it become common, and it's now being used. It was being used more by co it, consumers. It is being used by consumers. It's being used by some cities. I don't know how many, but it can be. And uh, this toxic chemical has been and continues to be used for decorative plants as a preventative measure when there's no current insecticide problem. Insect problem, I mean. The insecticides are being overused, which can kill the beneficial insects such as bees and other pollinators. Next, please. So guess what happened? <laughs> the consumer wasn't really happy when they were buying their bee and butterfly friendly plants starting in 2014 or earlier 2013 and they started complaining. So by 2019, the Home Depot and Lowe's, they stopped selling the neonic treated plants because they thought, hey, this is a great idea. I can get rid of all the insects and people will be happy. Well, they weren't. And so Costco, Walmart, True Value followed afterwards. They do. There are still plants that say they have labels on them that say neonic neonicotoids in this plant. And they, I think that's so, I would say it's 80% Home Depot and Lowe's have stopped selling. I don't know. I don't know the latest statistics. Next, please. So, thank you. City of Rochester is helping save the pollinators. And I just wanted to give you a quick update on the gardens. So, next, please. This was the first year of the Butterfly Garden, and, and this is the, this year of the Butterfly Garden at Municipal Park. It is lovely. They're expanding it. You're welcome to come to the ribbon cutting of the expanded garden on October 23rd, unless further notice. Um, so we're also going to be featured in the Rochester Post about our gardens because six we have six pollinator garden demonstration gardens being um, planted in Rochester, and that's a pretty high number for this size of a city. Next, please. Um, so where are they? Uh, in the fall, Mount Avon Cemetery around the mausoleum. Um, next to the Pink Creek bridge on uh, North Main. Uh, the uh, Heroes Point has got three or four areas around um, the, uh, uh, at the fire station of Pollinator Gardens. Um, Dinosaur Hill is implementing one next to the Children's Garden by a Girl Scout, nonetheless, <laughs> working on our Gold Award. Um, we call it Victoria's Garden um, and Rochester Hills Public Library. So next. Um, yes, recognize this, Tree Zone. The tree initiative has, an, has the educational component, and, you, and it was planted two indigenous oak trees, as you guys know, in Avon Cemetery this spring. I recognize some of you here that were attending. And oak trees support 256 species 
So if you got and accidentally got a tree with neonectinoids in them, that would end that, um, uh, that goal. But you guys are doing really good, so you didn't do that. Next, please. You also have a list of native trees, which is really good because that's what we need to restore in our natural ecosystem. Next, please. Again, so here's the reasons. It would defeat the purpose. Here's a reason to ban them. It would defeat the purpose if you're trying to save them and killing them at the same time with neonic sprays and tre treated seeds. Managing the public landscapes do not involve growing plants that feed people. Using this level of pesticide to protect decorative plants is unnecessary and overkill. Next, please. It supports the pollinator insects and sustainability, of which we have all been doing together. <laughs> it supports the city of Rochester's support of the Mayor's Monarch Pledge and Tree, tree Zone Pledges. It's smart land and management and good stewardship. Next. So what are our neighbors doing? You know, we look around sometimes. We say, what's going on? So I went to the uh, uh, called um, Oakland Township in Vanderweede. He's a naturalist there that oversees the 1,500 acres. And he said that Parks and Rec has a ban in their farm fields that have farm lease contracts. So they know they want to make sure their contractors do not bring them any neonics. And you know what? The neonics uh, treated uh, plants or seeds, they, your contractor may not know either. It's become, it's become that pervasive. It's just accepted. All outside contractors cannot use them. And they aren't used in their public areas because they, like Rochester, uh, try to do what's healthy for their um, residents. And, they, and so bottom line, they don't use them. Next. OK, next, please. Who else? Who else has banned or restricted? the use of them. Well, state of Maryland, they lost 50% of their beehives. The average was a third across the rest of the 49, United, uh, 49 states. Massachusetts, the two, 2021, has banned them for outdoor consumer use. Connecticut has done the same. Uh, consumers don't need them. Uh, like we said, it's overkill. The UA, UA, EU has banned the outdoor use of several of them. There's like seven of them. And in, in, in neonics, in Canada, uh, in 2018, ban, the ban started, and they're phasing out by 2021. Next. So, um, yes, the proposed state and federal bills. Saving America's Pollinator Act was introduced this year. Michigan's House Bill 4895 was introduced for review to, pan, to ban them on public lands. And then the Growing Climate Solutions Act passed by a vote of 92 to 8 in the Senate in 2021. So it is a kumbaya moment that happened. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Pass the peace. Um, so let me see. Next, please. OK. Are there replacements? Sure there are. <laughs> it's just, you know, 96 percent of cases can be, neonics can be replaced by effective and directly usable alternative pest control methods. And you can see 78% of the cases, at least one non-chemical alternative method can replace neonics. And the leaf and flower feeders are easier to control with non-chemical methods than wood and root feeders. All right, so last but not least, I'm getting there. So my ask is to make it a policy to ban neonicotinoids on city of Rochester-owned properties and create a policy that vendors can sell or can't sell or use plants that have been grown with neonics treated seed, neonics treated seeds or spray with any pesticide that has a list of seven neonic poisons. And also have a policy to review list of insecticides used for the safety of people, pets, and pollinators. And like I said, I know this, I, Colin and, and Craig and Nick have done a great job, and I want to commend them for that, but I also want to have something in place. Uh, I was asking for something in place that could be used as a guide as going forward. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Any questions for Marilyn Councilmember Albrecht? Marilyn, I know you talked to me about House Bill 4895. Um, would you want uh, residents to 
contact our legislators like Representative Tisdale to uh, yeah. call support to that? Yeah, I'm uh, going to be talking to Representative Mark Tisdale about this. They want to, they're asking to put this under review um, with the agricultural, uh, it's MHRD. I know you're active on social media and your, your business is marketing, but maybe if you give um, uh, on one of your pollinator websites how people can send a letter to uh, Tisdale or email or something like that, you you know, that might um, help us. Yeah, I would say contact me at pollinators at trentcreative.com and I can give you the information to uh, about House Bill um, 4895 to call your representative. We'll investigate it, call your representative, and let him know that you would like uh, the neonicotinoids um, researched and looked at and that you're behind uh, banning them. And uh, the website is rochesterpollinators.org. Councilmember Bavacqua. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to mention a little anecdotal story here. Um, the, the, the decline in the insect population and species, to me, is pretty scary. Um, I Yesterday was at a birthday party for a family member in uh, Charlotte, south of Lansing, and um, drove home around dusk into darkness, uh, 69, 96, through fields of, you know, farmer's fields and forested areas, I think when I got home, maybe I might have had one bug spot on my windshield. Um, if you think about, like, I don't know, when I was a kid, when I'd get in the car and go on a trip anywhere, it was a big problem trying to keep the bug guts off the windshield. And you're constantly stopping and scraping the windshield and all that. And th those days are gone. I mean, I, I, to me, that just is an anecdotal, scary scenario. I don't understand how um, we've managed to lose that many insects, and uh, and there's not more of a concern over it. Further questions? Um, Mr. City Manager, do you want to maybe bring back some some ideas about adopting sure. some I, of those policies? Ha happy to. Um, work with Marilyn and then the attorney uh, um, and our Parks Department to come back with some policies for Council's consideration. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Marilyn. You. Any, thank I have you. one last thing. I see yeah. Mark looking at the website. Truth and honesty. We will get that information up on rochesterpolitators.org. Okay. And thank you so much for reminding me. I did a lot of work getting this together and boiling it down. So I, I think I had like 60 slides and I got it down to, I don't know, 30. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next we have the OPC annual presentation. Uh, we have Renee Courtright, the director. Welcome, Renee, to our council. Hello. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor Vixen, city council members. I first like to take this opportunity to recognize our governing board representatives, um, Mayor Pro Tem, Nancy Salvia, and we have our senior representative, um, Douglas Gould, in um, the audience today. So thank you for your commitment to the OPC <coughs> and to the seniors that we serve. Um, I'd like to recognize the, um, or at first I'd like to formally take this opportunity to review the stats. And um, that's what I normally would do in the past, but um, and provide an overview of members served over the last year. But instead, I'm going to read a couple of testimonials from participants who benefited from the dedication of the staff and the volunteers over this last year. We continue to prepare, serve, and deliver meals and to our homebound seniors to transport them to their dialysis, to the grocery store, to their personal appointments. Um, during a COVID pandemic, and then also providing our fitness, art, enrichment activities within the facility. Um, so I'm going to start off with um, this particular letter um, to the staff of the Senior Center at OPC. I can't thank you all enough for the meals you have brought me. Um, the past three months, but not just the meals, your smiling, cheerful face underneath your mask brighten my day. I look forward to those days that you knocked on my door. Thank you. And then we also have another note. As you um, are aware, we, instead of our normal picnic or we had our Thanksgiving dinner or our Christmas dinner, 
For Valentine's Day, we also did the same thing. We did a drive-through lunch. It was a nice opportunity for those individuals that didn't feel safe coming to the center, but they still were able to come out, get a nice hot meal, and be met, met and greeted by our staff. So this particular individual wrote, I just returned home after our Valentine's Day lunch provided by the wonderful people at OPC. The ladies were smiling and pleasant even though the temperature was very cool. We appreciate the many things offered to us as OPC members and thank you very much for all you do. The lunch today was warm and delicious and made our day very special. Thanks to all, Marianne and Bill. That's just a few of the many notes we've received over this last year. So, um, you know, we know that many of our members, it's a very important source of socialization, OPC is. And so um, we continue to be committed to their socialization, to their health and wellness throughout this last year um, with, first of all, programming under a tent. And then we came indoors into the gym, into the auditorium, into the studios, in the dining room, keeping everybody socially distant and safe. And, and then we just continually just added on more programming as we, let, um, as we went along. And then in the month of May, we had our spring into action um, month, in a sense, where we had all kinds of activities and invited people back. And uh, we had 400 new members that joined the center in the month of May, which is fantastic. And they continue now to walk back into the door and come into the center. In June, we resumed our congregate dining in meals. And then in Ju July, we were to formally open up our doors and welcome everyone back in. Of course, there is still pre-registration for some of our activities, but now we have the drop-in cards and games and, and, in a sense, a bit of normalization. So um, I'd like to just express my sincere appreciation to the Rochester community for their commitment to the seniors, to the OPC during this very difficult year. Um, I just can't thank all of you enough for your support, um, for getting the word out there, for making phone calls um, with our telephone reassurance. So um, thank you. We're keep on keeping on. And, and as I say to everyone, we OPC, it's all of us together serving the seniors. And we couldn't do it without you, without your support. So thank you so much. At this time, I'm going to turn over to uh, Tim <coughs> Sobe, Administrative Director, who is now going to review the budget with you. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, and good evening. I'm just going to take a couple minutes to go over the highlights of the budget. Um, to be perfectly blunt, and I guess we want to advance those slides, I think like three or so. If, uh, another one right there. That's Summary. The, yeah, that is. Um, which is hard to see from this point, but uh, basically to put it to... Uh, to a summary point, the budget that we have this year, uh, the board has adopted, is pretty much the same budget as last year. Um, I think as you can understand, budgeting in this time is kind of difficult. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty going on. As Renee said, we are open. We're getting more people back in, but the level and how they'll come back in is sort of unknown. So to be honest, the OPC board passed a budget that was basically a state pad budget. Um, not many changes at all uh, have been proposed in this budget and were approved by the board. Probably the largest presentation change involves our fund balance. Um, <coughs> the board, right now, with this adopted budget, we will have a fund balance in total of roughly $3.6 million, which is 76.6% .6 of our annual operating uh, expenditures, which is nice, solid foundation for us. And one of the reasons we need a solid foundation is, I think, as most of you know, we are unable, per the interlocal agreement, to issue debt or borrow money. Therefore, any capital needs that must happen, any improvements or any replacement have to be drawn either from fund balance, operating revenues, or fundraising. So for an organization of our size, we need to keep a good size of cash available to meet the needs. We're in a 16-year-old facility. We maintain it very well. We keep ongoing 
improvements. However, it is a 16-year-old facility, so we have some concerns going later on. Um, the change that was done is regarding the designation of the fund balance. The board had a policy and passed a policy several years ago that 25% uh, of our expenditures remain in fund balance as untouchable, you know, unless everything falls apart. So that's the first level of fund balance. We call it target fund balance, and that is, that is an untouchable amount, about $1.2 million. Last year with the pandemic, the board decided to also designate and create a budget stabilization account. This is fund balance that could be used in case of emergency. Again, with last year's pandemic and the recovery this year, it was uncertain whether how our revenues are going to go and our expenditures are going to go. So we reserved an amount of balance, almost like a contingency account. Should things happen, we'd be able to draw on. So that was created last year and still sits there. It's uh, not our intention, never our intention to use that, only use it in dire facility, uh, dire circumstances. This year, as we discussed with the board, the, the budget, budget needs for the facility, particularly the age of the facility, we talked a lot about the capital improvements that are down the road. And further on in your budget, near the back, you'll see a capital improvement plan. We have a number of items, particularly our HVAC systems and things like that which we maintain, but should they go, are extremely expensive. The board uh, proposed this year that we take what's in the budget stabilization fund and split it into two accounts. The, uh, the, the budget stabilization will still remain, and that at this point is $1.2 million, and that could be used in the event that we have operating shortfalls or expenditure overruns that were unforeseen. Again, almost like a contingency account. We have no intention to do that. We don't need that money. The budget is balanced without use of that money. But it's there for emergency needs. The other half is now designated for capital improvements. That money will stay for capital improvements. Anything not spent will be put into the capital improvement fund to build the reserve. So in effect, that day when Hopefully it will happen long after I'm gone. Um, the HVAC system blows up or something like that. We will have a good deal of money to um, replace that and keep the facility going. That's probably the major change that's in this budget. Other than that, it is a standard, uh, standard operating and as we've been going for the last couple of years. So. Very good. Tim, we know you're not leaving or going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any questions for the OPC? Just a comment. Uh, um, Councilmember Harrison? Yeah, Thank you. Comment Thank question you or comment? for the presentation. Thanks for being here this evening. I, I have a question for Renee. I'm wondering if people are interested in supporting the OPC, if you have any uh, events coming up or ways that we can help support you. I do. First of all, thank you. Amanda for participating in our 5k run walk for Meals on Wheels. We raised over $30,000. That was in June. So thank you so much for that. Um, we have our um, soiree. Our summer soiree is August 20th. And that is going to be part, um, happening in our lovely Stone Cottage Gardens. Um, it will start out with a champagne reception, um, a nice dinner by um, that's being Cruzamir in our um, wonderfully decorated uh, magical gym so and that is happening in August so we're looking forward to that we are also having an Oktoberfest mm -hmm. something new and different for OPC and that is I want to say August or excuse me September 16th and so that's going to be a Thursday September 16th and it's something fun and different. We were trying to appeal to our, our wide expanding membership and, you know, 50 to 100. You got a lot of uh, different ages and in, in, in interests. So thank you. Yes, and we will also have our, our, art and cra um, our artisan market is going to be happening in November. So thank you. Yes. I do want to make a comment that we have not expanded our hours as of yet, so in case you do have some questions from um, your um, um, members, um, we 
of course, have an issue just like everybody else. When, hence, we furloughed our staff, we've had a hard time um, finding new members to, or staff come back. And so there are some positions open. When we are able to fill those positions, we will be expanding our hours, our opening and, and our um, evening hours and the weekend hours. But as of this time, um, we're still filling those positions. So if you know of anybody that might be interested, go to our website mm -hmm. under the About Us tab. That'd be fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Pearson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say thank you, Renee, very much for being able to manage the OPC during COVID and take care of everything and keep things above board and still be there for everyone. I think that's outstanding. That's a huge accomplishment. So thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Salvia. Yes, thank you. Um, so again, thank you, Tim and Renee and the entire finance team there at the OPC. Um, a very strong budget. Um, I think Tim highlighted, you know, um, sec Schedule A, which has the details around the, uh, the designated funds for capital improvement, which I think was really important. You know, this budget, this three-year budget does reflect the, the new millage increase that was approved by voters. So I think it's important to show the transparency that we are planning for the future and planning for those capital improvements um, and, you know, planning wisely. So the OPC is all one of our favorite places. And so um, I would just like to make a motion to approve the or accept. What motion? To accept it? Mr. City Manager, accept Yep, motion to accept. Motion to accept the three-year uh, budget as presented, so fiscal year 2022, 2023, and 2024. Support. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem Salvia, support by Councilmember Peterson. Is there further discussion? I would just like to say real quickly, you guys are doing a great job. Thank you for that presentation, and thank you to the Mayor Pro Tem and to Mr. Gould for serving on the board. And I think that fund balance is... is just an excellent number to hear because I remember one time we were struggling with that so congratulations on that and um, great job so thank you madam clerk the roll please Vixen yes Salvia yes Albrecht yes Vavakwa yes Harrison yes Peterson yes Sage yes thank you thank you guys thanks thank for you. coming thank you. Um, now we're gonna have public comment Brian do we have a caller I am not seeing any hands up right now, Mr. Mayor. Hello. Oh. oh. I hear somebody. I hear Jane. There that, is a caller online. Is that Ms. Turner? Yes. Hi. How are you? Hi. Welcome. It's your, it's your turn. Thank you. Um, I have a secretarial thing, if that's even a word these days. The phone number on your agenda inter introducing how to get a hold of the public comment is 312-626-6799. But on screen in front of me right now, and the one that I called is the 646-558-8656. I really think that should be correct. Manager, which which is it, or is it both? Um, actually, I think Brian actually is the one that puts that number in there. Um, so Brian would have to confirm he's the one that's uh, watching both the live number and the one that's in our packet. Okay. So both of them work, is what you're saying. Brian would actually have to let you know. He's the one that controls the numbers. Yeah. Brian, I'll have to confirm that number then. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm thank you for the. Uh, on 412, it didn't work. Okay. On 426, it didn't work. Well, I'm sorry it didn't work. It's supposed to work, but it worked tonight? I know. Well, no, I had to call the number on the screen oh, okay. on my telephone. Okay, well, we'll get, we'll, we will try to get that fixed by the next meeting. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. I have another item. Okay. You know I live on Parkdale. Correct. You know, I have a beautiful garden in front of my house and behind my house. I was out working over the weekend on one of our few low temperature days. Right. The traffic on Parkdale 
is horrendous. I understand it's a main artery, but it's also 25 miles an hour. I haven't seen a policeman. They may be there, but I haven't seen a policeman out there stopping feeders, nor have I seen, if you look into the state law, 25 mile an hour restricts large trucks and commercial traffic off of the street. I would like to see something done about that. Mr. Manager, um, I know this is not a new, new problem. We do have the chief uh, virtual, if you if you want me, or I'm happy to bring something back after at our next meeting. Yeah, I just think some some plan to maybe now that traffic has picked up again, Lightness. maybe it's something. If you if you got some ideas, we would be more than happy to hear them. All right, and then chief, I don't know I if you wanted. Like Hello. Yeah, we I still would like to see them now. Well, they'll be out there. Uh, I could have them out there right now, actually. Um, but they, they, try we could certainly step up our enforcement. As, as you know, we do, uh, and I'd be glad to share this with anyone. Um, you know, we're getting data from those speed signs, which does show what the speed and the volume of traffic is. And so, um, but you know, we'll certainly step up our uh, our enforcement in the area without any question. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Excuse me. Go ahead, Ms. Turner. Those speed signs are a quarter mile past where the speed limits are and past my house. So anybody who's coming up the hill from Letica, going west, speeds until the top of the hill in front of my house when they see those signs, if they even slow down. Is there any chance that we can have one of those electronic speed signs over by the AT&T box on the north side of Parkdale? I know you have two going each way on Ludlow. Chief? We can certainly try to uh, present that as a budget item in the future, and we can also put the uh, temporary sign out there um, I can get that done this week for sure. Yeah, and it also goes when going east, if you could put one in front of the water, water tower entrance, not down the hill where they can't see it, but in front of the water tower entrance, you can do it on my side or the water uh, or the east side. Okay. I would appreciate it. Sure. Okay. Not a problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you tell me how I can disconnect from mute, from unmuting? Um, Brian, can you help her with that? Yes, I can mute you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any further public comments from anybody in the audience today? Come on up to the... I'm seeing none. Okay, thank you, Brian. Then just uh, name and address for the record. Um, Alan Harris, 421 Pine Street, Rochester, Michigan, 48307. Um, here I'm speaking on behalf of my father, the property owner, La uh, Lawrence Harris, as well as my neighbor, uh, David Addy, 427 Pine Street. Um, I recently, or my father recently sent a letter to Chief of Police regarding, um, <clears throat> excuse me, some permit parking signs that were previously in front of our homes, 421, 427, before the sewer work that took place a couple of years ago. Those signs were removed. And now along Pine Street, there are no parking signs except in front of our homes. And the unintended consequences of that is that now business owners are using our um, homes, in front of our homes, as parking mm -hmm. so that their employees or their patrons can use their parking lots. Yeah. And also uh, patrons of taverns are using our, our homes, in front of our homes, as parking in lieu of actually utilizing the beautiful new parking structure that was put up. And so um, my wife and I have the enjoyment of uh, a lot of spirit, well-spirited people coming out at 2 in the morning after the bars close, um, which is causing the noises, basically, a disruption. 
as well as when we need to use that parking, it's unavailable because of business owners and other people that are using that. So basically the request is from both a signed letter, I could bring it up, I think uh, Chief has received it from my father. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have, have it. yeah, okay. we got so a copy. Just the, the ask is simply to return basically to a previous set when mm -hmm. both of those signs were placed. I'm sorry for jumping in line. I didn't know that it was on the agenda. I just wanted to make sure that my voice was heard. So. Thank you. Chief, do you have any comments related to that? No, that's towards the end. Uh, as I said, uh, your uh, item will be uh, considered here shortly in the agenda. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I apologize no for problem. jumping no in problem. here. Yeah, it's item no 10C on the agenda. Okay, well, thank you for thank your you. time. You're welcome. Anything further? Okay, next is the approval of the minutes. First, we have a consideration of the minutes of the regular meeting of June 28, 2021. So moved. Motion by Councilmember Peterson. Support. Support by Councilmember Sage. Discussion. Madam Clerk, the roll, please. Mixon? Yes. Salvia? Yes. Albrecht? Yes. Bavacqua? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sage? Yes. Thank you. Next, we have a consideration of the correction to the March 22nd, 2021 City Council meeting. Mr. City Manager, do you want to explain to the public? Uh, actually, the clerk probably is their minutes. Yeah, Madam Clerk. <laughs> yes. Uh, last week, um, we discovered that uh, the motion um, from March 22nd regarding the community house and its project was. Uh, wildly inaccurate. Uh, I think what happened was I took notes, put the notes in there, and I meant to get with uh, Council Member Vavak, um, Salvia to get her written and I, uh, motion, and I did not do that. So um, before you this evening is um, the suggested correction, um, and if Council agrees, then you just need a motion to approve the correction. Motion to approve the correction. Support. Support. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem Salvia, support by Councilmember Peterson. Did you support that? Um, I'm Mark did. Uh, Councilmember Albrecht. Uh, discussion. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, I went back and reviewed the um, meeting, and um, you know it is what she has there now. Everything it just laid out a little differently prior, so it was very clear, exactly as stated. Very good. Further discussion, Madam Clerk, the roll, please. Mixon. Yes. Salvia. Yes. Albrecht? Yes. Bavakwa? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sage? Yes. Thank you. Now we'll move on to the approval of the consent agenda. First is a consideration of request to accept a municipal credit contract from SMART for fiscal year 2022 and to transfer the city's municipal credit to the OPC. Next is consideration of a special event application from Paint a Miracle to hold the Paint a Miracle Art and Appetizers Art Exhibition on Saturday, August 14th in the Rochester Mills parking lot. Next is consideration of a special event application from the Rochester DDA to hold the French Port Stories event on Tuesday, July 27th on Castell between 3rd and 4th. Next is consideration of a special event application from St. Paul's Methodist Church to hold their Summerfest event in the church parking lot on Sunday, August 29th. And E is a review of the current 2021 event calendar. Motion to approve as presented. Motion by Councilmember Peterson. Support. Support, Support by Councilmember Harrison. Uh, further discussion? Madam Clerk, the roll, please. Bigson. Yes. Salvia. Yes. Albrecht. Yes. Pavacqua. Yes. Harrison. Yes. Peterson. Yes. Sage. Yes. Thank you. There is no old business or table items tonight. There are no public hearings. On to legislative deliberation. First is a consideration of several proposed ordinance amendments to the city's Chapter 32 offensive, specifically loitering, nitrous oxide, and controlled substance violations for first reading and introduction. Those certainly sound ominous. Okay. Motion to approve. Um, motion by Council Member Peterson. Support. Support by Council Member Albrecht. Discussion? Councilmember Harrison. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just want to be clear. Maybe this is a question for Mr. Wing. This is basic housekeeping, correct? This is not a response to anything that's happened recently. It's just a, to make sure that our laws are up to date with the state. Is that correct? Chief and uh, Attorney Crott, I see both of them kind of noting. So, uh, Mr. City Attorney, would you like? 
I'm sure I'll, I'll certainly let Chief uh, jump in if he would like, but uh, I, I would say yes and no. Um, I, the, uh, the loitering, uh, I would say, is uh, more in response to what the, the police officers are seeing out there. Um, periodically, when situations arise, you know, I, I get calls, and I know that there's a lot of uh, in-department uh, discussions about, hey, how would we handle this situation or this situation? And, um, and so sometimes we take a look at the ordinances and uh, decide that they, they just aren't um, quite clear enough to address a situation that uh, it's in front of uh, the police department. And uh, for instance, the loitering, um, you know, there's, there's situations where um, there's been a, a lot of congregating on parking decks um, and uh, parking, uh, regular parking uh, areas that uh, really shouldn't be congregating and that leads to not necessarily violent situations or anything like that but congregating of and there's things that happen there that that are breaches of the peace and 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 we just thought that the, the situation would warrant uh, maybe beefing up our current we, we do have a current loitering ordinance so we looked at surrounding um, surrounding cities uh, and how they address it to see if they have something that would be more appropriate and so we did add uh, just a, a little bit of language to our current ordinance to essentially pick up parking lots and, and ramps um, uh, since we have parking structures now. Um, as far as the nitrous oxide, uh, that one came from uh, uh, Chief Schettenhelm that we have seen that happen and, and that one I would put in your category of uh, updating to match uh, current state law. Um, it was originally, from what I can tell, originally was modeled after the state law back 20 years ago, um, and since then the state law was uh, amended just a little bit, um, and so we thought just bringing that one up to code uh, would be appropriate. Uh, and finally, the controlled substances, that, that is a, a real-life uh, situation where we don't have anything um, that specifically dealt with a situation where a police officer has um, comes across some uh, people that have, uh, we'll say, pills or ecstasy pills, you know, for, as an example. Um, and, but in low quantities, but still illegal. Um, you know, the, traditionally the police department would um, provide that to the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office to, to prosecute that, uh, since we wouldn't have a, we don't have a local ordinance for that type of thing. And the prosecutor's office has become a little reluctant with lower quantities versus higher quantities of materials, and the police department has uh, requested uh, from the detectives uh, on this one. Uh, that, that have something that they could write under local ordinance when that situation arose, where uh, the prosecutor's office would see, you know, a few pills. We still want to regulate that and control that, but the prosecutor's office, uh, you know, they've, they've been not as quick to, to write charges on, on those things. So I would say your, your, your good question is kind of a yes and no. Um, real life on two of them, uh, situations driving those changes, and one is uh, uh, state law. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Chief, I don't know if that if I missed anything in there or if you had something to add. Oh, I, I think that uh, sums it up quite well. I would add on the controlled substance uh, situation. It does allow us to um, issue a misdemeanor violation mm -hmm. um, in those cases where we can handle that in a, um, I guess, a, a easier uh, way than dealing with the prosecutor's office and also for someone who uh, is a first time offender, uh, has very small quantities of whatever particular substance, we can handle that uh, aside from uh, issuing felony charges in those cases. So it, it gives the officers some discretion in uh, how to handle the case and also uh, kind of streamlines the, uh, that situation just a little bit better for uh, both the uh, officers and the detectives. Thank you. Very good. Further <clears throat> Council Member Bavacqua. Yeah, just a quick comment regarding uh, the loitering portion of it. Um, when we went out for uh, our annual uh, drink after the last council meeting, uh, uh, in, in lieu of our, our Christmas opportunity because of COVID, uh, after the last meeting, uh, there was a group congregating in the uh, parking structure, and I sat and chatted with them for, for a minute. Um, they, they were on skateboards and, you know, just trying to be teens and be social and enjoy themselves. And uh, unfortunately, they don't have, like, a skate park to go to or something that they can do that's not in a more publicly used arena. 
So um, just food for thought that, you know, maybe if they had another option, they wouldn't be in an area like that. So thanks. Thank you. We need one. Is there discussion? No, I just Council Member Peterson. Yeah, I just want to add that I think it's a good move to be able to take this off the county books and all of that and have it local here and actually be able to write these tickets as they as they happen and um, use your discretion uh, to help keep the streets a little cleaner and not take so long to have these things, you know, take place. So I think it's a great move to up, update our policies here. Very good. Madam Clerk, the roll, please. Fixon. Yes. Salvia. Yes. Albrecht. Yes. Pavacqua. Yes. Harrison. Yes. Peterson. Yes. Sage. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Next on to reports and regular business. I have a suggestion just because the applicants here. Maybe we move uh, item C before A and B just to yep. um, facilitate because that those might be a little longer. So if that's okay, Madam Clerk. Yes, sir. Okay. So next is evaluate request to implement a residential permit parking zone in front of 421 and 427 Pine Street. We heard the applicant discuss that. Uh, Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris, thank you. Um, I was going to say, Mr. Police Chief, would you like to uh, uh, add something? Certainly. Um, if, if you recall, uh, we have uh, implemented from residential permit parking zones. So those are areas where the residents uh, must register their vehicles and, and use a guest permit in the case of someone coming to uh, visit them or a service worker or something of that nature. Those, from, those zones are on uh, the remainder of Pine Street, Oak, uh, also 3rd and 4th Street. Uh, and that was in response to, as the uh, gentleman had indicated, people kind of using those areas as their own parking areas to circumvent the meter parking and, and paying for parking in the structure. Um, the, that process has worked quite well for those residents. We get very few complaints. Compliance has been very good. Um, we did have these two homes that are right in the middle of the area between the dentist's office on the corner of University and Pine and the Pink Creek Center for the Arts. Uh, apparently, a number of years ago, uh, there was actually uh, more restrictive parking uh, signs that were there in the course of history and time. Uh, those signs uh, were removed, and we received uh, a request from the two residents there uh, to implement permit residential permit parking, which would, again, uh, require those residents to register their vehicles. They'll have a sticker that they'll put on their car so we know that that car belongs in the residential permit area. And they'll also have guest permits that guests uh, who uh, come to their residence could use uh, if need be to park there. Um, if this is uh, approved and implemented, we do go through a warning period, uh, in which case we, we alert the drivers that uh, are probably parking there today uh, that they won't be able to do that in the future before we then ultimately issue violations um, for illegal parking. Very good. Council Member Albrecht. A uh, question for uh, the chief. Uh, uh, thank you for the map you included in there, and I think you might have answered it, but are there only two homes on that street? Everything else are commercial properties? Correct. That is correct, yes. So uh, will people still be able to, will they be parking in front of the commercial property? Is not a problem with those? You can't park because... in front of the commercial there. They have okay. permit, permit only. Okay, so I, I'd like to make a motion to um, well, approve. Can I? Oh. Yeah. Uh, Chief. So that the, if I can just clarify, so the re, there is parking that's uh, down by Pink Creek Center right. for the Arts. There, but not at the there other isn't end. parking that's by the dentist's office itself. So this would restrict the parking merely in front of those two uh, residences. So there would still be parking that would be allowed uh, by patrons of the Pink Creek Center of the Arts or anyone else uh, further down. It wouldn't restrict parking in the entire block. Correct. Okay. I'll uh, thank you, that Chief. Motion. Okay, so we had a motion by Councilman oh, Robert. Yeah, uh, I have the motion okay. to implement the residential per permit parking zone for uh, the residents of 421 and 427 Pine Street. I'll support that. Support by Councilmember Peterson. Uh, discussion, Councilmember Harrison. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to ask administration and the chief to 
evaluate other residential streets that could require permit parking. I think that this is a good idea. Mr. Gould and I actually talked about this this morning, ironically. I, I think that it will drive more people to use our parking structures. So I think that this makes sense both for our residents and for you know the parking structures that we just built. So if there are other areas that we can implement this, I would like to encourage that and we'll be supporting this. Good. If I can uh, respond to that, we do do this and have done each of these on uh, requests from the neighborhood. So uh, rather than us uh, trying to implement parking that either residents want or don't want, uh, we ask them to kind of uh, help us to do that by uh, soliciting a petition as they did on the two blocks of Pine Street, all the blocks of Oak Street, and third and fourth. Uh, we did work with residents on First Street uh, for a period of time, and there was never enough, apparently enough interest uh, where no petition was ever forwarded to us to request, I'm sorry, on Second Street, uh, to bring forth permit parking in that area. Um, but we would certainly entertain any uh, resident area that uh, has sufficient need and interest in doing it. Um, we would certainly work with them as we did with those other residents as well. Thank you, Chief. Good. Councilmember Peterson. No, and I appreciate uh, the two homeowners coming forth because I have watched for four years or longer, um, uh, because my friends used to live there, that um, the dentist office was always abusing that and parking in front of their homes. And so I think this is um, a good move, and I'm glad they brought it forth so we can correct that. Uh, plus, it's it's a you know there's not a lot of actual um, parking areas for them to park their own vehicles so it is nice to um, have this implemented for that purpose so very good madam clerk to roll please Bixon yes Salvia yes Albrecht yes Avacqua yes Harrison yes Peterson yes Sage yes see how easy that is so good. <laughs> yep. have a good evening thank you Okay, next on to the transportation with the Beaumont update and discussion. Mr. City Manager, do you want to lead this off? I can start off, and I know the fire chief, uh, along with Anthony and Nick, are in the uh, upstairs uh, conference room. Um, I believe Brian's going to be walking with the chief through the PowerPoint presentation, which I think is about five or six slides. So, okay, Brian, if you want to pull up the fire PowerPoint and uh, chief tell them when to go to the next slide welcome chief Anthony and Nick you okay? yep. a little louder please can you hear me now yeah yep. better thank you okay I'll try to speak oh, up if I trail off let me know please Brian if you could go ahead and bring up the PowerPoint please yeah I'm, I'm looking through my email I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. So in the minutes. <laughs> you have it, but... use the one in the packet. If you want to use the one in the packet, Brian, if you have your computer, I can log in and forward it to you. Page seven. Okay, I can use the packet one. Let me pull that up. All right, thank you, Brian. Page 76. It's page 106, isn't it? Oh, is it? Oh, you know what? I'm looking at the number on the PDF thing. Sorry. Okay. What's that, 75? You said 126? 106. 106. There we go. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mayor, um, yep, good Chief. evening, City Council. Tonight, uh, I'd like to go ahead and present some additional information for your consideration in regards to the Beaumont transport discussion. Next slide, please, Brian. Um, working with the city attorney, um, uh, we work with uh, the attorneys from Beaumont to go ahead and put together a uh, proposed uh, agreement between the two entities um, to go ahead and um, put the fire department in a position that uh, transports could be done at uh, from the Beaumont, uh, Troy, and Royal Oak. 
um, back uh, to the city of Rochester within a 10 mile uh, radius from that stand truck. Next slide, please, Brian. Uh, basically, before uh, we were doing uh, transports out of Crittenton Hospital, we never really had uh, anything officially put together. We've been doing transports out of Crittenton for about 10 years or uh, 11 years. And uh, at one point, we were up to around 580 transports on an annual basis. Uh, those money that we recovered from the transports then went back to the general uh, fund from a reimbursement standpoint. Next slide, please, Brian. So just kind of talking about the staffing model and um, how the process works. Currently, we staff with a normal uh, staffing of six people. Occasionally, we might run five if we have somebody sick or on vacation. Um, we typically have on uh, most shifts two paramedics and four EMTs. Uh, currently, we have one shift right now with just uh, one paramedic and five EMTs. Um, and we go ahead and uh, maintain that basic staffing level with the priority of taking care of the, the city um, response from that standpoint. Could you go to the next slide, please, Brian? So with uh, the transports, we've had pretty good experience. We're doing the transports out of Christmas for 10 years. You see the standard uh, annual maintenance budgets for the uh, vehicles. Um, we did some anticipation with uh, what we thought we would get from transportation uh, from Beaumont. And as you know, it's a few extra miles to get to Beaumont. Um, it's a difference of about 4.6 miles. Crittenton, I think, is right at one mile. Going to Beaumont is 5.6. So that gives a difference of 4.6. And we tried to uh, indicate that on the slide. Um, as far as the revenue generated, um, the revenue generated, we're guessing at about 300 transports with a revenue generation of about uh, $144 per transport. And that breaks down to um, $85.61 is the cost of the ambulance and the maintenance and uh, additional mileage um, at almost $3, which gives us a total of $88.19. Um, currently, we, re we are recovering about $360 per EMS call. I took the lowest average, which would be a transport that was paid for by Medicare, and Medicare would pay us $232. So the lowest on a transport collected would be a difference of $144 worth of revenue. Um, and again, I tried to do some guessing of, uh, of about 300 calls in the anticipation of what the volume might be at, um, at Beaumont. Can we do the next slide, please, Brian? And I believe this is this is the part of the agreement. So mm -hmm. I think you can probably uh, need, don't need to go through the entire agreement at this point in time. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, we tried to go ahead and, and take a look at uh, um, how the, the transports had worked over the last 10 or 11 years. We're look, using the, the same process. Um, the phone call from the hospital typically starts out at dispatch. Our dispatch then uh, calls over to the fire station and will talk typically to the uh, shift officer and, and would say, hey, we have a transport that's going uh, back to sunrise at 10 o'clock. Are you guys available for it? If we have the proper staffing, um, the answer would be yes, we could go ahead and take it. Or if we did not have the proper staffing, the answer would be no. Um, in some cases, we would say, uh, we can't do it at 10 o'clock, but we could do it at 2 o'clock. Is that okay? And so sometimes there might be a change in the time. Um, once the, uh, if the transport is accepted, uh, we'll send uh, the car, the ambulance over. We know ahead of time whether it's uh, uh, ALS, advanced life, or BLS. The large majority of the calls are BLS and requires uh, two EMTs or an EMT and a medical first responder. Um, they would go to the hospital, pick up the patient, and transfer them to the point, and turn and uh, turn them back over to either to their house or to the uh, assisted living to where they're returning to. Um, we tried to go ahead and take a look at uh, the estimated 
um, the income levels, and that's why we, we put in the $42,000 of estimating it on somewhat of around 300 transfers. Um, just a little, some statistics for you, just to kind of let you know where we've been in the past is in 2019, um, we did 180 or 1,889 total incidents. Out of those 588 were transports. We averaged about five calls a day in 2020. We did 1,218 uh, total incidents, 98 with transports for an average of about 3.3 calls per day. So far this year, uh, we've done just under 700 or 699 uh, total calls, 86 with transports for an average of about three, um, uh, 3.88 calls per day. Um, there was a, a question uh, about ET3 status. If you'd like, I can cover that now or I can cover it uh, at the end. Um, now, they can cover it now, I would guess. Yeah. Okay. And so, then uh, just uh, real, real chief, uh, chief, excuse me, um, Mr. City Attorney, did you have a comment? Uh, the only comment I, I was uh, noticing is that there's two agreements. The one that is on the screen now is a training agreement, mm -hmm. which really doesn't have anything to do with the transport. Um, so when the chief kind of looked at it a little, a little funny because it's the, the transport agreement is just a few pages later, like 10 pages later in the agenda packet. Mm -hmm. So there's two, uh, two agreements for consideration. One is this training, uh, which uh, Beaumont would provide uh, training opportunities for uh, the fire department individuals. And the second agreement in the packet is the actual transport agreement. Thank you, Chief. Go ahead. So just, um, I'm sorry, I guess I got a little back. I'm not sure why I'm getting a, a repeat and echo. Are, are you, am I coming across okay? Mr. Yeah, you're, you, you're coming off fine here. Okay. I'm sorry. So ET3 status, you may, might remember we've talked a little bit about ET3. ET3 stands for Emergency uh, tree, Transport and Triage, um, along with uh, three departments in the area that have gone together as a partner. And this is a Medicare, Medicaid package. Uh, the three departments that are working together is Rochester, Rochester Hills, and Auburn Hills. Um, we started our ET3 uh, during the first week of July. Um, up to the, the first week, these, none of the departments have had a call. Uh, we have still not had an ET3 type uh, call yet. Um, just a little bit of uh, information that the calls have to originate through our 911 dispatch. Um, the patient uh, condition uh, for alternate destination must meet the uh, criteria set by our med control. In other words, they have to have um, a, their vital signs have to be within control and certain limits. Um, I won't go through all of those details, but they have to be fairly stable. Um, a good example would be that if uh, we went to somebody's home and they had a twisted ankle, uh, where that might not need to have to go to the hospital, they would have an option to go to one of the approved um, EMS centers, uh, and uh, or if they want, they would still they could go to the hospital, but they would have a choice. Um, really, the alternate destination um, that allows the resident to be able to save uh, money as opposed to paying a fee at the emergency room, they could pay a lower fee typically at one of the 24-hour uh, um, medical centers um, that we would end up taking them to. The other part of the ET3 is uh, the treat in place. Um, we're not, near, not at all ready to go ahead and launch that part. We're still waiting for the hospital to go ahead and uh, get us some additional information and clearance through med control. Um, what we are still waiting for is the hospital needs to just determine how they're gonna deliver the medication to the incident address. Um, also how the hospital would determine what are some of the counter indicators of the medicine that's being delivered. In other words, they're gonna have to contact the patient's doctor to make sure that whatever the doctor at the hospital is prescribing is, does not have any interreactions with other uh, medicine that the patient may have. Um, in addition, we're waiting for the hospital to, to give us an idea of whether they'll send a nurse or a physician assistants to go ahead and administer uh, the medicine, um, or there is some discussion between the three uh, uh, fire departments to go ahead and come up with uh, 
a, an alternate uh, methodology of going ahead and do that. Um, so we don't really see this, uh, the treat in place uh, starting for any time near, in the near future with all of the details yet that we're waiting to go ahead and get from the hospital. So we are, um, with the approval, running the alternate destination, um, which will deliver uh, the best of care to our residents at the uh, best price, um, but remembering that the, the uh, patient or the resident always has the choice of the destination as to whether they're going to uh, go to the hospital or they're going to go to one of the uh, EMS centers um, or clinics. Um, and with that, Mr. Mayor, if there's questions or or uh, thoughts that I can uh, specifically address for the council. Thank you, Chief. Are there any questions for the Chief? Okay. Discussion. Councilmember Peterson. Do you want a motion? Um, you can make a motion if you'd like. I'll make a motion that we move forward with this agreement with William Beaumont um, Hospitals for the uh, transport and also for the training program that they are going to offer. Okay, motion by Councilmember Peterson. Is there support? Support. Support by Councilmember Albrick. Discussion. Mayor Pro Tem Salvia. Okay, so first question, maybe I should have raised my hand quicker to get to the question. So um, probably a question for city attorney. Can this agreement be modified to restrict uh, it to just specific Beaumont facilities? As it's written, it seems it's any Beaumont facility. Can it be restricted to only Troy Beaumont? Mr. City Attorney? So the answer, the easy answer to that is uh, Perhaps um, the this agreement has not been signed by anybody yet. So, if City Council's direction uh, would be to move to approve it with uh, restrictions, uh, the exhibit is the one that lists the locations. Um, so, if City Council's directive uh, to uh, the Fire Chief and, and myself to uh, move forward with the agreement with a restricted number or uh, locations then we will certainly bring that to Beaumont and see if they are agreeable. And if they are, then th that's a signed contract we can get from them. Uh, and if it's not, we could certainly bring it back and say they wouldn't and here's why or here's what they're willing to do. So this is, uh, that is your, your call. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I have a question regarding that while we're on that subject, okay. if I may. Sure. So um, the thing is, though, if the people the people that we're going to be taking to the hospital have the right to choose where they go, would that limit our residents from going to a hospital of their choice? Uh, can, I, can I answer that, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, Mr. Chief, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councilperson Peterson, our patients would always have the choice um, uh, to go to whichever hospital they like. Um, we will though follow our protocol depending on the type of injury. We'll make certain recommendations to the patient. An example is, is we do have some rules that we have to follow from med control um, in the event that say somebody is suffering from a stroke. We have hospitals that are approved uh, as stroke centers that we would need to take them to that location. Or if they had, were suffering from a serious trauma uh, we might be required to take them down to Royal Oak Beaumont, which is a level one trauma center, as opposed to Ascension. Um, but I would say that our patients always have, have the choice of where they would like to be treated, um, with, with the only exception of, depending on their injury, to where the most appropriate hospital might be for them to get their care. Well, follow up then, because it didn't really answer that. So, would would this restriction then cause that person to, for us to not to be able to utilize that service? So, I think. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chief. No, it would not. Okay. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem Salvia. Okay. So, second question. Um, so, while the additional revenue is very important. Um, to me, what the priority has to be is service for our residents and making sure that we have ambulances, staff, paramedics available for our residents for emergency needs. So my question is, how do we make sure there is no undue pressure put on 
anyone to take a run, take a call that would leave the city, the residents, short. How, how, how can you assure us that money isn't going to drive this? Chief? Well, I guess the only, the, my best answer for that is, is we've been doing this for 10 years and we've not had a case to where our residents have been put second. We've always put, put our residents number one and we have 10 years of track record showing that we've made good decisions when it comes to uh, making sure our, our residents are treated as number one and transports are not the priority. Our, our residents are the priority. And if we have enough staffing, then we do the transports. Councilmember Albrecht. Maybe I'm a little slow tonight. Um, I'm looking at slide, and I, you know, I know Councilmember Sage has a lot more, uh, a few more questions than I have, but I wanted to combine two things. Slide 133, Exhibit A of the agreement, says. Uh, William Beaumont Hospital Troy was transferred to all of Beaumont House other hospitals and facilities. So that's the exhibit I think the city attorney referred to. But then I go to the handout that we received as um, I think it's part of the packet, I think it is. It says additional information pertaining to the transportation topic. And I'm just reading from this. Beaumont service that need a patient transport. They would contact our dispatch and ask if we can take a patient from their location, Troy. So we're only focusing on the Troy facility, is how I read this. Our decision process to take the transport is based on the following considerations. What type of transport, what is our current staff law availability, staffing level now reduced to level four, and what is the destination? And it says, so it's a, use a 10 mile radius for the Rochester Fire Station. So in my simple mind, I'm looking at this exhibit A and what is written in this additional information is thinking, are we only taking uh, residents or transport between Troy, Beaumont, and 10 mile radius from the fire station, how do the two coincide? One's an official agreement that we have to sign, the other is this um, description. When I read what's on the additional information, I'm su I support this. That's revenue, we're taking people from Beaumont, Troy, to our, basically, to our place facilities in the city of Rochester. We're not taking them down to Allen Park or other facilities. So as I read this, I'm fine with this proposal, but I'm confused by the Exhibit A. So if somebody could clarify Mr. that for me, uh, that's, that's, that's where I have a disconnect. Mr. City Attorney, did you? I might refer to the, the Chief on that. I don't okay. think I have the additional information. Uh, chief? But I think Mr. City Attorney, correct me if I'm wrong, that. but within the, within the confines of the contract, we have the right to go ahead and take the, uh, the transport or to turn the transport down. And uh, Councilperson Albright, that's why that we put together a little bit of a decision tree as to which transports we would be willing to consider to take. Um, not necessarily that we will take, but we would consider to take based on the criteria, making sure that we have adequate staffing uh, and those items are in place and that the request is within that 10 mile radius of the fire station. And I believe, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, city attorney, that the uh, agreement gives us that right to go ahead and accept or turn down the request of transport. Uh, that, that would be correct. Uh, this is permissive on both ends. Uh, Beaumont does not have to request a single transport from Rochester. Uh, and uh, the city of Rochester does not need to accept such transfer. We, we had a lot of discussion on that with, uh, with their people, their administration, as well as their attorneys. And, and uh, because one of the concerns was if we turn things down, does that hurt us in the, in the long run is getting new tra or other transports? And uh, Chief, you can correct me, it's been a bit, but they were like, no, it, if, you, if you don't want it, you turn it down and that won't be held. They just go to the next one. Um, it, it's a, kind of a rotational uh, situation. Is, it, is that, that's your recollection as well, Chief? Yes, Mr. City Attorney, that's that's your the recollection is correct, and that's also the way we had administered the process with uh, Crittenton or Ascension with the same methodology that we could either accept or turn it down, and uh, it was on a rotational basis typically. Okay, Councilmember Sage. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and, and, and I was here on council when we did do the Crittenton agreement, and I, there, it was very beneficial to the city, and uh, I thank you, Chief, for bringing that to us. So the different complexion here is that was a confined area, if you will. I mean, we really didn't have to have any standard operating procedure because the, the uh, facility in question was right here in our backyard. So now we have consideration of a network that is vast, and we have some guidance here for us to consider that would say, okay, we would only consider one or two locations within this network. So I'm concerned about um, possibly the respect we would give Beaumont and the integrity of the city. Why would we willingly sign an agreement where we are already telling them publicly we're going to violate the, the wording that we will with transport to all Beaumont Health's other facilities and hospitals? I, I, that, that's hard for me to imagine we would willingly enter into. So I was... I'm, I'm hopeful that other people have asked, and I would ask the city attorney as well, can we define it down to, if we're truly comfortable with two locations here within the network, could we get it down to that? Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. City Attorney. So the, the Exhibit A that you have before you is the proposed one that hasn't been modified in, in a while. Um, so this discussion of narrowing it down to uh, one or two locations, that's something that we would put in there instead of the, the language that's in Exhibit A. So it, to, your, to your point, it wouldn't necessarily be a, a violation um, because we, we still have the ability to turn it down. However, I, I believe that it would be a good policy if the direction is we would only do it to one or two facilities, you name them, and that's what the Exhibit A is for. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what you do is we would, that Exhibit A wouldn't read that way anymore if you restricted it. Because right now it's, it is absolutely unrestricted um, to all of their other hospitals and facilities. So the, the final agreement would not have that language in there. So that the, the concern of, I guess, violating or, or saying we agree to do all these other things, but we really only mean to, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be in place anymore. Councilmember Sage, are you referring to Royal Oak and Troy when you refer to two? Those would be the two I would consider. Oh, I just wanted to clarify that for the record. Okay. So, okay, we're still discussing it. Or are we changing the motion? I guess. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're still in discussion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything further, Councilmember Sage? No, sir. Councilmember Peterson. All right. So you know because. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of trying to figure out why we would restrict it only to the one hospital when that whole family of hospitals is there and set up for a purpose, and that's why they included all their other hospitals and facilities. So I, I'm, I'm not sure why we would do that because if I'm unless someone can answer, if we were to transport somebody to the one hospital and what if whatever was going on, while their in route has to go, something went crazy and they have to go to another hospital. Are we right. then not going to be transporting them, continuing that transport? Well, I, I guess uh, I'll let the chief answer that. I, I assume that if there was some emergency, of course, you'd go to the hospital. Go to you'd Carmanos. You'd go to agreement. wherever you need yeah, to go. This is just for moving people between. Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, Mr. Fire Chief. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to emphasize this is what we would consider non-emergency transports from okay. the two, let's say, the two targeted hospitals, uh, Troy Beaumont and Royal Oak Beaumont. An example would be that we would take a patient from Sunrise Assisted Living to Troy Beaumont, as we do quite often, and when that patient uh, is read, has been treated at the hospital and has to go back to um, sunrise assisted living by ambulance because of their medical condition, then uh, we would have the opportunity, if providing our staffing was correct, to go ahead and pick that patient up at uh, Troy Beaumont and bring them back to sunrise assisted living. This does not affect 911 emergency calls and the normal process that we've always followed um, to the proper hospital for the type of incident or injury that the person is suffering from. This is just for non-emergency transports from either Troy Beaumont or say Royal Oak 
back to within 10 mile location within the fire station. Thank you for clarifying. Mayor? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Salvia. Thank you. Chief, I had um, one other uh, question regarding um, staffing and certification levels. So I know that we've had some discussions on this around uh, when we, you know, change to the current model, the safer grant, et cetera. Um, you know, with this additional, I'll say, work that we're looking to take on, um, I would like as a part of this discussion to have a review of staffing and certifications and the process for certifications. Um, you know, I guess I would request as part of the motion if we could review that maybe by calendar year end um, that would tie in with the SAFER grant. Well, Mayor Pro Tem, I can tell you just an inventory of certifications right now is currently we have uh, nine paramedic firefighters 20 EMT firefighters, five firefighters, one EMT, and one firefighter medical first responder currently certified on the fire state fire department at this time. Um, the, that's our current status. Thank you. Okay, but you, you would like a report? Yeah, so I guess in terms of, I request a, a friendly um, amendment to the motion. We've discussed uh, limiting the um, hospitals to Troy Beaumont and Royal Oak Beaumont. Um, I would like to request review of staffing and certification status by the end of calendar year 2021. And I would also like a final agreement when signed provided to city council. In the past, sometimes we've done agreements and I haven't seen the loop close. So I think that would be helpful since we've had a lot of discussion on this to see the final agreement. Mr. Uh, Councilmember, no, I'm good. Okay, and then support. Yeah, yes. Okay. Councilmember Sage, uh, quick question with regard to the friendly amendment proposed. Would that also apply to the training agreement? Those specific to those two locations only, or would we be uh, would we be within the entire network on the training side outside of the medical transport? Um, no. Isn't this what the um, Beaumont's offering to us? Is that what you're referring to? He's referring to the training. So, Chief, could you speak to uh, the training and kind of what the, uh, the benefit to the city is and what the expectations are as well? So the benefit to the city is, is if you can imagine, the city of Rochester, um, we do not have a lot of cardiac arrest, thank goodness. And so having the opportunity for EMPs or paramedics to go ahead and shadow and, and to improve or work on their skills at say the emergency room at Troy Beaumont would be a benefit. Um, some of the uh, firefighter or some of the paramedics may have interest in shadowing one of the emergency room doctors and, uh, and at Crittenton Hospital, they've had an opportunity to go to the cath lab and see some of those procedures. So this would be not only continuing education, but the opportunity to go ahead and practice skills, um, especially for a new EMT that is learning how to go ahead and do things like blood pressure and other initial physical surveys for patients, um, having the opportunity uh, at the hospital to go ahead and practice those skills gives us in the city uh, better prepared uh, uh, EMTs and paramedics. And, this, this is not the only place that we can go ahead and get the training. There are other places that we can get the training also, but being able to have that working relationship with, uh, with the Beaumont system is a benefit. I don't see any need to limit it from the training standpoint. Council Member Sage. Okay. Council Member Albert. I, I'm just looking at the agreement. It does say the first recital is that, um, Blah, 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 which operates an acute facility located at 44201 DeQuinda Road, Troy, Mich Michigan. So are, are they saying that's where all the training is going to take place, uh, Fire Chief? That would be our primary I'm sorry, I'm getting feedback again, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, you, you're, that would good. Be our, if, you're good. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're good, no. Chief. All right, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, Councilperson, 
that that would be the primary place that our uh, firefighter, our paramedics and EMTs would work out of is at that uh, emergency room area. So I, I think to Council Member Sage's uh, point and, and Mayor Pro Tem Salvius, it, it's already in the agreement. So I, I think it's a non-issue. Okay. So Mr. City Attorney, so if we pass this, they have to agree to it, correct? Correct. So right now it says the entire system, we're saying Royal Oak and Troy only. For the, for the transport. For the transport, for the training, it's everywhere, potentially. Yes. In fact, I think the next uh, whereas in the recital, it does mention uh, that the hospital has facilities for furnishing clinical a clinical site for training. I, I think that suggests more. I don't know if that was just Troy, but I think that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, but this may be a little different than the, the transport situation because these are planned in advance situations and the training, or excuse me, the staffing would account for uh, these individuals being at training. Is that is that correct, Chief? Yeah, that's correct, uh, Mr. City Attorney. An example might be going to Royal Oak Beaumont because of the level of trauma center and the types of things that may go on down there and the skill enhancements that our paramedics might be able to get. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you know, even for, uh, you know, burns and uh, certain wound cares at the other uh, hospitals. Chief, I have a question for you. So do you think they'll, Beaumont will go for this by changing it? Mr. Mayor, I, I don't know, but I, you know, I, th I think they would. I think this is okay. um, mutually uh, beneficial to our residents and um, also for Beaumont to go ahead and, and uh, uh, have us do those transports. I think one of the other side benefits that maybe does not get recognized is the relationship building that uh, that goes on. Um, I'd like to compliment the, the team from Beaumont because they reached out to us, um, you know, 18 months ago or 24 months ago about wanting to improve their um, relationships with the city of Rochester and working together. Um, I believe uh, the uh, city manager could even make mention to that. that they've also reached out to uh, to the team here in the city about trying to continue to build good relationships. To directly answer your your question, uh, Mr. Mayor, is, is if the council would uh, prefer to limit it, that, then that's exactly what we'll ask to go ahead and do. Um, to be honest with you, I probably would have limited it with our right of refusal to those two hospitals anyway. Um, it would not be in the best interest for us to go to Wyandotte or to other Beaumont facilities to do transports. Um, we would just not, we would not be able to manage that process to where I would feel comfortable that we would not hurt the city residents. So um, what city council is suggesting is more than likely what we would have uh, done anyway with our right of refusal. Very good. Um, further discussion? Okay, Madam Clerk, the roll please. Oh, wait, but can we summarize? Yes. The, Matt, uh, and was there an agreement to the amendment to the maker of the motion? Yes, I think there yes. was. Okay. But, uh, Ms. Madam Clerk, do you mind reading it again? To approve the two agreements with uh, three amendments, uh, restrict the locations to Troy and Royal Lake Beaumonts, uh, to amend, um, to review the certificates um, for all the fire personnel by the end of this calendar year and to have the final uh, agreements once um, executed to come back to council. Yep. I would say certificates and staffing levels. Okay, and Councilmember Peterson and Albrecht are good with that. Yeah, and the review of staff, uh, the review of staffing, certifications, and training is what was stated. Very good. Madam Clerk, the roll, please. Bixon? Yes. Salvia? Yes. Albrecht? Yes. Favacqua? No. Harrison? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sage? Yes. Very good. Thank you, Chief, for your work on this. And Thank you, we'll look forward and we'll look forward to hearing if Beaumont agrees and it comes back to us. If they do agree, I'm happy to uh, give council both copies of the training agreement as well as the transport. Very good. Thank you. Next is on to a consideration of land contract payoff for the Mitzelfeld lot. 
And this has been a long time issue in the city, I will say that. Mr. City Manager. Yep. Uh, again, in our packet, I believe it's on 110 in the actual printed packet. Um, and Anthony, our finance director, has put together uh, a pretty comprehensive uh, memo explaining um, that actually by paying off our, our debt early, um, there's actually some interest savings. And so uh, this is recommended both from finance as well as administration. Anthony, if you want to just give a brief overview. Anthony, welcome. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Council. Uh, yes, just, just for those that um, maybe are, are wondering that, uh, where this is coming from. So obviously, COVID, we've had a big impact on the parking fund and revenues. Um, one of the things we're looking at is, uh, as of review today, over the last couple months, we're, we're down uh, about 10% from pre-COVID for, for same time frame. So, so we've bounced back quite a bit. Um, roughly, uh, number-wise, that, that still leaves a delta of about 140000 a year operating that we're, that we're trying to, to address. Um, with this getting paid off uh, early, not only do we have the interest savings, but it eliminates $74,000 uh, a year in expense, so it cuts about half the deficit off. Um, and and it's, a, it's a good use of the uh, fund balance because the, the interest rate being charged in the land contract agreement is 4.5%. So we're paying a lot of interest, uh, a lot of interest rate on it. So it, it just, it, it's a good time uh, uh, to look forward to getting this paid off and closing that out. Very good. See Council? Councilmember Peterson. Um, first, I want to thank uh, finance for looking into this um, and for looking into an, an, another solution for the parking debt that issue that we have. And I'd like to make a motion to approve this. Motion by Councilmember Peterson. Support by the Mayor Pro Tem Salvia. I'll support with the um, comment that it's a very it was a very fair rate at four and a half percent when it was issued, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also very fair that we're able to pay it off early. Um, and I also would note that in the memo from finance that we will continue to look at other options to, I'll say, refinance this cost um, since interest rates will continue to be low for quite a period of time and money market rates will be earning zero. So any other opportunities, I know, I know Anthony's working on it, so I just wanted to recognize that, um, and I support the motion. Very good. Further discussion? Yes, I do. Councilmember Peterson. Want, yes, thank you. So paying this off, that additional 74000 a year is going to go directly to where afterwards. I want to make sure that it is going right towards the parking debt fund. So it's 100%, correct? Mr. Like Manning. not going the, back the into the general fund. Yeah. Say that again. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. That is a right. expense all in the parking fund, so that decreases the parking funds expense by seventy four thousand a year. It won't. It won't be general fund. It'll be parking. Okay. Just wanted to make sure it was going to stay there. Okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Albright. I, I was encouraged by um, our uh, uh, Anthony's report that you know the parking has picked up uh, uh, a bit, and I hope that trend continues. Um, can we? This is not part of the motion. Can we get a report on the parking fund at some point uh, uh, in yeah. the next month or two to see if that trend continues? Yes, and I think we're due for a, a parking okay. committee meeting, too. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think the next quarterly meeting is coming up. And then Anthony would give a report after. Thank you. Yeah, and that's very good news because the last parking meeting it wasn't such good news on usage, so that, that's a good thing that's coming back. I just... I'd just like to say for this motion that we've been trying to do this for years and years and years. So it's <laughs> to me, it's a no-brainer, as they say. So I absolutely support this. Madam Clerk, the roll, please. Mixon? Yes. Salvia? Yes. Albrecht? Yes. Bavacqua? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sage? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we did see before, so now we receive a report from various boards and commissions. We actually don't have any tonight. Um, is there any further public comment? Brian? There is none, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so now I think it's time that we um, 
vote to accept uh, Councilmember Babakwa's um, letter of resignation. Motion to approve. Motion by Councilmember Peterson. Support. Support by Councilmember Sage. Discussion and now I think maybe before we vote now is the time if anybody wants to say anything. Councilmember Albrecht. I'd like to just uh, uh, thank Councilmember Vacqua when Amanda and I came on as new council members. Uh, he um, made sure to call me and I think Amanda on a lot of issues that um, we still didn't have our political uh, uh, rookie card was still not checked yet. So, um, and while Dean and I, you know, didn't agree on every issue, um, that's what council is all about. And I always appreciated the debates and the discussions and the ability to disagree in a very respectful manner. So I, I wish him well. And um, uh, our loss will be Pontiac's gain. And I'm sure at some point or another we'll be seeing uh, Dean on the political scene somewhere else. So thank you, Dean, for helping me become a better council member. And good luck to you and your 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 wife, uh, Melissa, in your new home. Mayor Pro Tem Salvia. Thank you. I just want to um, thank you as well, Dean. It's been great working with you. Uh, came on council together, campaigned together. Um, I'm, I'm sticking around. Hope you stick around <laughs> a lot longer. I do have an election coming up. Um, but just want to thank you. You're so hardworking, so passionate. You're a great communicator. So just thank you. Thank you. Council Member Harrison. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Bavacqua, you've been a great mentor to me as I've taken this seat on council. I really appreciate all the, the guidance and the healthy debate that I think has gone on um, on our time serving together, and I think you'll, you'll be well missed. Councilmember Sage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, too, want to offer my thanks for your, your service, Dean. Um, I've, I've specifically appreciated your thoughtful approach to uh, a lot of the issues that are brought here before us and your willingness to uh, stand by not only your decisions but your convictions and support for the decisions you make uh, and have made. I haven't, I haven't agreed with everyone, <laughs> but that's been, to Mark's point, the, the best part of this. And I also want to thank you for your friendship. Um, I really wish you and your family a, a lot of success and happiness in your new adventure. Thank you. Very good. Councilmember Peterson. I'll just uh, wish you and your family very well in your future in Pontiac. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Councilmember Bavacqua. Uh, do I have to recuse myself from this vote? I'm not sure how this works. <laughs> no. I, I think you can probably vote yourself, vote yourself no, you out. Yeah. Unanimous. <laughs> yeah, it has to be unanimous. Right. Oh, okay. Or if it's not, and if it's not unanimous, then it comes back to the next right. meeting. Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh, so there's a procedure for everything yeah. <laughs> that we didn't know about until we researched it, or the we, the city clerk and the city manager and the attorney. Um, so I, just finally, I'd like to say uh, to Councilman Ravacqua, first, I, I say this as all of us who are on council, I appreciate people who take the time and effort to be in, as Teddy Roosevelt said, in the arena working for the betterment of the people of Rochester, taking the time, putting yourself out there to be elected to campaign and do all that. You know, it's an honor for all of us to serve up here, but there's also, um, you know, contention and things like that. So I appreciate you getting involved in the process. So I thank you for that. I also thank you for your passion on the issues and the city. Um, again, we didn't always agree on everything, but we could agree to disagree um, and we could be friendly about it and talk about the issues. And you served on planning commission and budget committee and facilities committee and the cemetery committee and on council and did a lot of volunteer work in town. So, I mean, all that will be missed, and I thank you for that. And then finally, as Council Member Sage said, the friendship. Um, you know, I always say that sometimes, sometimes when people leave council, you kind of never see them again because that's kind of the one thing we all have in common to some extent. And, um, but I think we'll probably be, hopefully I'll be seeing you and your family again and uh, appreciate your friendship and your service to the city. So thank you. And having said all that, Madam Clerk, the roll please. Mixon. Yes. Salvia. Yes. Albrecht. Yes. Bavacqua. Yes. Harrison. Yes. Peterson. Yes. 
Sage. Yes. Okay, next to the city manager, a receipt of the check register report and the city manager update. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, for the check register reports, we had July 1st and the 8th. And as for the manager updates, I uh, just wanted to uh, highlight a few things. Um, our newest ambulance, the dedication, is scheduled for the Friday, July 23rd at 6 p.m. Uh, at the fire station. And then we'll have, uh, it'll be a brief uh, ceremony and event, and then uh, some brief refreshments will be served. Um, also, just wanted to note uh, our summer newsletter, the electronic version is out, and it's also, uh, it's been pushed out to those that have signed up, and it's also on our website. Um, it has been sent to our printers and uh, already prepaid for the, the post office uh, uh, to deliver it so as soon as it can um, there'll be a slight difference because of the uh, the printing time we'll have uh, a few things that are in the printed version um, so that we didn't have things out of date um, for this July to August uh, versus the online version the online version does have those other events that the DDA and PSD are are, are having still here uh, at the end of July that's all I have we good um, just says, are there any other comments from the audience while we're here. Seal, did you have anything today? Okay. Just hmm? I think she's here for our closed session. Thank you. Thank thank you for that. Um, um Madam Clerk, anything tonight? Uh nothing this evening. Council can look for um an update on your applicants um Thursday evening. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh Mr. City Attorney? Uh, nothing, thank you. Council Member Albrecht. Nothing, Your Honor. Councilmember Vacqua. Nothing, thank you, sir. Mayor Pro Tem Salvia. Um, I just wanted to give a, a brief update on the community house since we had the minute um, correction, minutes correction, just kind of reminded me that um, we did get the drawings this week. Thank you, Aseel. Um, so those were reviewed by the community house and prep and administration and prep to go to planning commission on August 2nd. So once Hopefully that has gone through planning commission. Then there will be uh, a, uh, an event scheduled to sign the 20-year uh, agreement. That will be a public event, and that will also kick off the um, publicity around the fundraising campaign. Remember, the community house is responsible to fundraise for 500000 for the interior of the building, so that will be... Um, there is a publicity f uh, firm working on that uh, for the community house, so you'll be hearing a lot more about that to come. Um, that and just thanking, thanking administration for the increased use of text messages for the alerts, specifically the one around trash day. You know, our hol ours always falls around a Monday, Tuesday, so people always ask me, and I'm never quite sure. So hmm. thank you. And encourage all residents to sign up for those text alerts. They're great. Yeah, I, th I think that text alert was good for the trash this time because that was confusing this year, <laughs> I think. Uh, Council Member Sage. Uh, nothing this evening, sir. Council Member Harrison. Nothing for me. Council tonight. Member Peterson. Uh, just two things. One, um, I was doing some housekeeping through minutes, and almost exactly one year to today of our last minutes of July 13, 2020, uh, we had voted as part of the budget to do a non-union comp non-union compensation study uh, and approve thirty thousand dollars to do so. However, we have not done that yet, and I wanted to know, like, if that was going to be. It's been it's been a year that we voted to spend thirty thousand, and wanted to know where that was going to be. I had Community House on there, so thank you for that update. Is there a way that uh, facilities uh, we can get the drawings and the information that they've been working on, so we can review it? I believe the engineers actually sent that to the building department, and so I, I can see if we have extra copies. Uh, I'm assuming they sent I the can 18. just yeah. go in and look and return it. That's fine. Yeah. I, okay. I would like an electronic copy. I just saw the big. Yeah, one. okay. Yeah. yeah, haven't seen anything, so um, thank you. And then next, um, some people approached me to bring up that the possibility of a dog park, and I know uh, Council Member Babakwa talked about it in the past as well, but uh, some residents would like to get together and start some private funding for that, and we would like to know if they were to do that, if they would have, um, if we'd have a park area that uh, we could use, and they have seen that one of the most underutilized parks we have is Howlett, and didn't know if that could be a great possibility, so... 
that is tasked to the administration to find out and the police chief as well. Councilmember Bavacqua. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I failed to mention this and I probably wouldn't be able to walk into my house if I didn't. Um, there's a dog wash this weekend. Uh, <laughs> I was going to mention that, right? Uh, at 9 a.m., uh, it's fundraiser for uh, CBC for our pollinator gardens and uh, mural in the park. And uh, bring your dog along, and it's nine ninety nine, and uh, Mayor Bixon will wash your dog for you. So there you go. I'm sure that requ I'm sure that dog washing requires a lot of supervision, though, too, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I guess most important, if we can um, actually find out when we're going to do the non-union compensation study, because that thirty thousand's been sitting there for a year. Mr. Yeah. City Manager? Yeah, we had a pandemic, so that actually kind of got mm -hmm. postponed. Um, I wish I could have postponed the pandemic. That would have been great, but unfortunately with the staffing study. So I'll pull that information back up, talk with the consultants that we uh, did receive proposals from, and bring that back to council. And, um, Mayor, if I may. And I brought that up because of the staffing situation that we have here at the city right now. I think it's most important if we are going to try to retain employees uh, instead of losing them um, that we uh, look at have that done probably sooner rather than later since it's, you know, really been a year. So even though it was a pandemic uh, last year, it's now been a year and we haven't talked about it. So I, I, I truly am, you know, uh, passionate about it. I actually brought it up in 18, 19 and in 20 to actually have that staffing study done. So, you know, unfortunately, uh, again, uh, we weren't able to get there. Um, we do uh, have operations to adjust. So our salary schedule was adjusted by 1% uh, as council went through the, uh, the the budget process for both our union employees are through our contracts as well as our non-union employees so um, although a comprehensive review I, I still feel is is valid and then the 30,000 is still earmarked in the budget then uh, Anthony can talk about to me uh, the budget actually uh, it goes back to the general fund so council would have to uh, to reallocate again we would uh, bring forward uh, proposals for council's consideration. I think the years go up so we didn't spend it, so we have to reallocate it. Okay. Anything else, Councilmember Peterson? Nope, I think okay. that's it. Thank you, Mayor. So I had one was the dog wash um, for the CD CBC on uh, Saturday from nine to nine to one. I know a number of us are going to be there, and we all have nice T-shirts. So. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the, the DIA. If you ride on the trail uh, up to Lake Orion, there are now art exhibits all the way up, which I think is very nice. So I think the DIA is uh, fulfilling their their promise to you know be out in the co our county and stuff, and I, I, I think it's great, and I know people were, were watching it. And then also just to uh, give a shout-out to, I, I call it the Ra Ra signature event starts the the tennis tournament starts next Tuesday the 20th out here in the municipal park so if you want to come out and enjoy tennis um, it's fun people sit up on the hill and watch tennis so um, mayor how many times have you won it um, I have won it not to brag but I have won it a number of times <laughs> and due to the weather this year it seems like we haven't been getting out much so I have a I have built-in excuses already. <laughs> uh, I haven't complained enough, so that's coming up. So um, we have a request for closed session to consider the purchase of real property with the intention of not coming back to uh, to to council. So moved. So the mo motion by Councilmember Peterson, support by Councilmember Albrecht to go into closed session. Madam Clerk, the roll, please. Bixon. Yes. Salvia. Yes. Albrecht. Yes. Bavacqua. Yes. Harrison? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sage? Yes. Thank you. So we'll take a five minute break and then we'll. Thank 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.